YouTube, how's it going? Welcome back to Bananas Epic Gaming. And today on Bananas Epic Gaming, we are filming another episode of Cage Talk. Now, I said I wouldn't do this episode yet because it seemed like they were going to pump out three Scream movies back to back to back. But they didn't announce Scream 7 at Seminacon. So, obviously, today we're going to be doing a re-ranking video. And that's going to be the Scream series and this time, it's only going to be the movies. We're not going to do the TV show. So, Scream 1 through Scream 6. And this is going to be Cade's Talk number 73. Please be sure to like and subscribe. Tap a little bell on that YouTube app so you never miss an upload. And here we go. Coming in in 6th place is still going to be Scream 4. Now, spoilers alert for all the Scream movies going forward. If you haven't seen them, go watch them, like this video, come back, and hear me out on this. Scream 4 is one of the more popular ones of a franchise. In a series well known for having a big opening scene, Scream 4 announces its arrival and its return. With a rather brilliant conceived sequence. I'm not going to say what the sequence is in case you haven't seen Scream 4. You have Jill Roberts, who's played by Emma, Emma Roberts. Kirby Reed, who's played by Hayden Panettiere. Charlie Walker, Olivia Morris, Robbie, and Judy Hicks. Jill Roberts and Kirby Reed are the two bigger names of... The new generation back in 2011. These actors and actresses are all nice additions to the movie, but by the end of the movie, spoiler alert, you only have Judy Hicks, and spoiler for Scream 6, you only have Kirby, who survived from the new cast. Everybody else dies. Over the years, this fan base has made me dislike this movie more and more and more because of the narrative that Jill is the best killer of the entire series because she almost gets away with it. And the fact that they went through half the cast within the first 30 minutes to an hour of the movie bothered me. This cast is very strong, like I said above, but the fan base has made this movie hard for me to like. And the Vaseline camera... Uh, Shots where it looks like somebody rubbed Vaseline on the camera and filmed a movie made it really hard to watch. You can especially see the Vaseline shots in the cops and Ghostface death scenes. And that's why this movie is in last place. Also, one of the biggest debates for the last 10 plus years was... Is Kirby alive? Because we never got an answer if she died until Scream 6, where it is stated by her she only died for a few minutes. Overall, Scream 4 is very effective. It's Wes Craven's best film since Scream 2, back in 1997. As a veteran horror director, he seems to flourish Scream 3 aside. When telling a story of this sort, and balancing of comedy and horror elements. For the horror fans, there are good jumps, a decent amount of gore, good kills. Olivia has one of the best kills in the entire series. And although I wouldn't qualify this as particularly scary, however, it works as a thrill ride. And if you're a fan of this franchise, it provides exactly this kind of horror meets comedy tone that you would expect from a Scream film. Now on to the fifth place movie. And now coming in in fifth place is a movie in the series that has a little bit of a semi rough history because it got rewritten because of Columbine and this one was supposed to have Stu Mocker as the killer again. It was supposed to tie everything back up. So with that being said, the fifth place movie in the series, as of right now, is Scream 3. 
Now, Scream 3, to me, this was, like, one of the first ones I was able to watch in the theater. Because when the first two came out, I was just a little kid. So, Scream 3 holds a little special place in my heart. Because Scream is arguably my favorite franchise in horror. But this movie is bad, man. Spoiler alert on the killer. Uh, the killer in this one... There's no possible way that he could do it alone, but with the story that they did it, he had to have, because this Sydney's brother, Roman Bridger. Scream 3 takes place in Hollywood. Like I said, it got rewritten, so we don't know what the original script would have been other than a cult and Stu Mocker maybe being the, kill- being the killers together. But... Screen 3 takes place on the set of Stab 3, Return to Woodsboro. And the opening kill is Christine and Cotton. Cotton is a fan favorite from Scream 2 and Scream 1. The little uh, appearance he had in Scream 1 when he was mostly in Scream 2. And he was in here for maybe a cup of coffee. He was in the movie, I believe it was like maybe 15 minutes, no less. It's been a while since I've seen this one. The kills are above average. You have a house exploding. You have Cotton getting stabbed multiple times. You got Christine getting stabbed, which is his Cotton's lady. You got Tyson getting his neck basically broken and thrown off a ledge. You got Angelina Tyler, who was a killer in Scream 3 in one of the scripts. Getting stabbed and pulled off screen. You got a throat slit from the Milton. You got Jennifer Jolie, who's played by Parker Posey, who is one of the better characters. You got Dewey. You got Gale. Sydney's in hiding. This movie is a, is a roller coaster. It's like Scream. Meet Scooby Doo. Yes, it's not the best, but it's not the worst in my opinion. I've grown to like this movie as the years have gone by. And looking at it like, okay, this is supposed to tie up the loose ends, and this was going to originally be the send off to the series, I'm okay with it now. That's why I like it. Another reason why I like it above Scream 4. The original trio get their time. Power Capozzi is a tremendous addition to the cast. And then you also got the guy that voiced Kronk and Joe Swanson in this movie too. If you haven't seen Scream 3, go into it with like little expectations and you will be satisfied. Now on to the fourth place movie. Coming up next on the Scream re-ranking is going to be Scream 2. And here we go. So Scream 2 is a sequel to Scream. And it, it was set two years after the first movie. And it came out in December 10th, 1997. The Scream also brings back Nev Campbell, Jamie Kennedy, Courtney Cox Arquette, and David Arquette, and Roger L. Jackson to the series. Scream 2 is set in college as Maureen Evans and Phil Stevens attend a sneak preview of Stab. Stab is a movie within a movie. It is based off the book that Gail Weathers wrote in between the movies. Of the events of the first movie. Now, Maureen Evans gets killed in a movie theater full of people. Phil Stevens gets stabbed in the ear. And events transpired, and Ghostface is back. Now, Dewey arrives to look over Sydney and make sure Sydney and Randy are okay. Gail Weathers is there with her new cameraman reporting on the news. Cotton Wary gets a bigger part in the movie because he was just a cameo in the last movie. And Debbie Salt, who is a news media 
Anchor is also there. Debbie Salt, the reason why I singled her out is because she is the mother and one of the killers. She's the mother of Billy Loomis. Now, Sydney studies alongside her best friend, Hallie McDaniel, and her new boyfriend, Derek Friedman, and their friends, Randy Meeks and Mickey Altieri. Mickey Altieri is the second killer in this movie. This movie also went under a little bit of rewrites because of a script leak. And Derek and Hallie were two of the killers in the original script. And I think it was better that they rewrote that because it being the boyfriend again and the best friend, I didn't like that. This movie also had the guts to kill off one of the survivors of the last movie when they killed off Randy Meeks. And that is still felt to this day because R- Randy Meeks, his niece and his nephew, uh, Jasmine Savoy Brown, who plays Mindy Meeks Martin, and Mason Gooding, who plays Chad Meeks Martin, are in the series and they are still alive because they got introduced in part five and part six. We also met Randy's sister on Scream 3, and she's their mother. So there's that connection. This movie, I, I like this movie. The kills are good. You have Sarah Michelle Gellar, whom most of you know as Buffy or Daphne. You have uh, Joshua Jackson. You have Louis Arquette. You have Jerry O'Connell, Timothy Oliphant, who I mentioned earlier. He's Mickey. You got Lori Metcalf, who most of you would know from Roseanne, she plays Billy Loomis's mom, and of course you got David and Evan Courtney, like I, like I mentioned earlier. They are in every Scream movie, but obviously Dewey's not in Scream Six. Nancy o- O'Donnell, Luke Wilson, Tori Spelling, Luke and Tori have a little cameo because they play Billy and Sydney in Stab. You got a good cast here. I like it. Scream 2 may not be most people's favorites, but it's one of mine. It's a good time, good kills, good suspense, some good chase scenes. That girl chase scene in the studio is one of my favorite chase scenes in the entire series. And Wes Craven knocked it out of the park with this one. Now on to the next movie. Now, the next Scream movie coming in in third place. This one was hard because I love these last three movies. But coming in in third place is going to be Scream 5. Now, Scream 5 is the first Scream movie without Wes Craven. We have... The uh, original cast and Judy Hicks coming back from Scream 4 and the Wes Craven uh, saga. And Jenna Ortega is in this movie. Dylan Manette, Melissa Barrera. I went into this with expectations of I'm going to be either really happy or really upset. And I am here to see Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera. Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera brought life into this franchise again. This franchise feels special. And this franchise is in good hands because we don't need Sydney. Yes, it would be nice to have Sydney in Scream 7, 8, etc. But... If she's written off as she's getting her happy ending and she doesn't need to be here, I'm okay with that. Because Jenna Ortega, Melissa Barrera, Mason Gooding, and Jasmine Savoy Brown, they are very capable of carrying the franchise into this generation. 
Uh, General Ortega is the opening attack. She is the first person to survive a opening scream attack. And surprise, surprise, spoiler alert in three, two, one. It's the boyfriend again. Richie Kurtz, who is the boyfriend of Melissa Barrera's Sam Carpenter. Sam Carpenter is the sister to Jenna Ortega's Tara Carpenter. And the second killer is Amber Freeman, who's played by Mikey Madison. Uh, the reason why they killed is because they want to give Hollywood new ideas. And I'm 50-50 with that. I was like, okay. That's funny, and that's actually somewhat true. But that's too on the nose. This movie also had some brutal kills. Uh, Judy Hicks gets brutally stabbed in the open in broad daylight. Wes Hicks, who's played by Dylan Minnette, he gets stabbed through the throat. Uh, Kyle Gowner's character, who is Stu Mocker's nephew, he gets stabbed in the neck. We get a security card death who gets his throat slit off camera. And for the first time since Scream 2, this, mo- this movie franchise kills off one of the original characters. They kill off Dewey. Dewey dies. He dies doing what he couldn't do in the first movie, and that is save his sister. He saved Sam Carpenter's sister, Tara. Because Tara, when she survived that opening attack, she gets messed up. She gets stabbed like 10 times, 15 times, gets her leg broken, gets stabbed through the hand, and gets basically hospital bedridden for the entire movie. And Dewey went out like a hero. Yes, it only happened so Sydney could come back but it had to have happened because Dewey was going to die eventually because let's be real here surviving four of these attacks up until this point before this one would, would be the fifth is plot armor now the fact that Dewey's gone this Scream franchise is going to revolve around the new characters that I named Sam, Tara, Mason Goodings, Chad, and Jasmine, uh, Mindy. And Gail Weathers is going to be there, and so is Kirby Reed, because we find out that Kirby Reed is alive. And, well, the uh, little Easter egg. Now, this movie... The reason why it's not number two, because, or number one, Scream 6 exceeded all my expectations, and I'll get into that movie a little later. But Scream 2022 slash Scream slash Scream 5 is a fun ride. It's, it's scary, it has its moments, and I love, love this movie. Now on to the next movie. And now coming in in second place, this one might make people upset, but I can go flip-flop between these three movies, between Scream 5, 6, and Scream. But coming in in second place is going to be Scream 1, the original Scream. Now when Scream came out in 1996, Kelvin Williamson and Wes Craven betted on themselves with this movie and they struck gold. It may not have seemed like it for the first week or so because the box office wasn't that good for the first week. At least the first week if my memory is correct. Because you opened up a horror movie in December and people were wondering why. Scream is a cult 
icon today. And the franchise is still very much active today. Neff Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, Rose McGowan, Skeet Aridge, Matthew Lillard, Rose McGowan, Drew Barrymore, and the Fonz all star in this movie. And you knew with those cast members that this movie would be either good or it would be okay. In 1996, the horror genre was dead. Scream pumped new life into the horror genre. And this movie still holds up today. I've known people who have never seen a Scream movie. They watched the first one and they said that this made them love horror movies. Scream is a love letter to horror movies. Wes Craven not only made Scream, but he also made A Nightmare on Elm Street and The Hills Have Eyes. He is responsible for three really well-known big franchises and Scream is arguably top four in horror. The killers in this movie are Skeet Ulrich who plays Billy Loomis who is the father of Sam Carpenter and Matthew Lillard who plays Stu Mocker. And there is a big debate on is Stu Mocker alive because he got stabbed deep repeatedly. And he got a TV dropped on his head. So is he alive? I say no. Uh, the reason why Stu and Billy are killing. Billy is killing for revenge because Sydney's mom was having an affair with Billy's father. And that's the reason Billy's mom moved down and abandoned him. And Stu is doing it for peer pressure. Now, this is arguably one of the best horror movies ever made. And I'll stick by that. It flip-flops with Scream 5 and Scream 6. And I know that's going to upset a lot of people. But this is my ranking so on to the next movie. So coming in in first place is Scream 6. Scream 6 is set one year after the events of the fifth movie. We are now in college. We are at Blackmore University with Tara, Mindy, and Chad who are college freshmen. Sam is also here. She is working two jobs and living with her sister and roommate, Quinn, and seeing her therapist about her life and the events of what happened in the last film. The movie starts off with Blackmore University professor Laura Crane, who is played by Samara Weaving, who is being catfished by her student, Jason Carvey, who is played by the actor that most of you know him as, Flash, from the MCU Spider-Man, Tony Rivioli. Uh, Jason and Greg, Greg is Jason's roommate, are the Ghostface Killers, two of them, and they plan to kill... Laura, and they do, Jason kills her, outside of a bar in New York because of a C-. Now, Jason and Greg are plotting to finish Richie and Amber's film by killing the Carpenter Sisters. However, another ghost phase finishes off Greg and kills Jason by stabbing him to death. Sam is seeing her therapist as this is happening, and she goes home, and we meet the roommate, Quinn. Quinn is one of the ghost faces, and Quinn tells Sam that Tara is at a fraternity party. Tara is with Mindy. She's with Mason Gooding. She's with Ethan Landry. Ethan Landry is one of the ghost face killers. So we're, at, we're at four ghost face killers in this movie. We meet Annika Kayoko, who's played by Devin Nikito. 
She's one of my favorite new additions. And stuff happens. Uh, Devin, who who plays Annika, goes to get Chad. Chad and Ethan rush because they, they are needed. Uh, Tar is about to get taken advantage of. Some shoving happens. Sam appears, tases a guy in the privates because he laid hands on her sister. Tara is upset because she got embarrassed. And the news breaks out about the killings. And then we get told that uh, they can't leave town. Then they need to come down to the station. Then this leads to a bodega scene. Tara and Sam have like a cat and mouse game with Ghostface. Ghostface kills two customers and the owner of the bodega. And he leaves a mask. This is the second mask that he leaves. He left a mask at the crime scene for Jason and Greg. And he left a mask here. The mask for Jason and Greg's crime scene. He left the mask belonged to Richie Kurtz. And I want to say Amber Freeman, because it's kind of weird that they just left her out. Uh, the mask that got left at the bodega belonged to Jill Roberts and Charlie Walker, the killers of Ghostface 2011. And this brings in Special Agent Kirby Reed of the FBI. Kirby is alive. Now, they get told, Sam and Target told they can't leave town. They are upset, but it's understandable because you're key witnesses in a homicide. They go outside, they get questioned by the media. Gail Weathers is there. Uh, Sam swings and misses. Tara swings and connects, and they say that. You wrote a book about what happened after you said you wouldn't write a book about what happened and what would do we think. Gail basically called Sam a killer born and bred and she was made to be a killer and they leave. Now fast forward a little bit. We are at the therapist's house again. Ghostface goes after the therapist, breaks breaks in, stabs him in the nose, like rams his face into the door, unlocks the door, killing him. And he steals Sam's notes. So now we meet the cast at the park. They're going over the rules of a franchise. Mindy's going over it because she is her uncle. She's the new Randy. The rules of surviving a franchise, because we are now officially in a franchise, according to Mindy. Everything is bigger than last time. Bigger budget, bigger cast, bigger body count, with more beheadings, shootouts, and longer chase scenes. Everything that happened last time, expect the opposite. No one is safe, with the legacy characters becoming disposable, which is not looking too good for Gail and Kirby, and eventually Cindy when she comes back. Main characters become expendable so the franchise can live on. And she gave examples. Ellen Ripley, Laurie Strode, Nancy Thompson, Tony Stark, Luke Skywalker, all dying so their franchises can live on. Charge your phone in case you need to call for help, but don't answer if it rings. Check all dark stairs. Good enough. Don't leave your apartment, delete your delivery apps, and keep alert are some of the rules that she went over in the movie and some of the rules that they posted on their TikTok. Mindy also gave her top sub- suspects, Ethel Landry, the shy dorky kid, Quinn, the slutty roommate, and Annika, because Annika is the love interest and you should never trust the love interest. And now with this happening, we fast forward to the group being back at Sam, Tara, and Quinn's apartment. And this is 
or the next death scene upset me. We see that the, quote, cute boy across the hall, Danny, who we met earlier in the movie, who is Sam's secret lover, he's changing into a t-shirt, and he sees that Ghostface is in Quinn's room. He's in the house, and he's trying to get Sam's attention. And Sam tells everybody that they're dating. He calls, and they start pl- joking around. And then he airdrops them a photo of Quinn getting attacked. And not only did Quinn get attacked, but her uh, booty call, Paul, or Paul 2.0, got attacked and killed as well. With this, uh, Ghostface throws Quinn into the uh, living room where everybody is. Quinn lands on Annika. Ghostface comes out. They see that he's actually back. And from there, we get the ladder scene where we knew about a ladder scene going to be in the movie because of the trailer. Uh, Mindy gets slashed. Annika gets stabbed in the in the stomach, and the knife twisted and pulled up a little. Somebody took the knife so they couldn't fight back. Uh, Sam and Tara are on the opposite sides of each other. Tara's on the outside of the uh, house, and Sam's on the inside trying to find a weapon to fight back. Tara's with uh, Mason Gooding's character, Chad, as he is trying to get back in to help. But Sam, Annika, and Mindy lock themselves in Quinn's room as Danny puts a ladder from his apartment to their apartment so they can climb over. Mindy's holding off the door. Annika's bleeding. Sam is trying to crawl as fast as she can. Sam makes it over. Mindy and and Annika are going to go one at a time. Annika says, go, I'll be right behind you, I promise. Mindy makes it, and uh, as Annika's walking over there, Ghostface gets in the room and starts messing with the ladder. She, uh, Annika scr- screams, please, I don't want to die. And she falls to her death like three, I want to say it looked like three stories, hits her head on the dumpster, killing Annika. And we get the Mickey Altieri mask here. We also got the Roman Bridger mask where... The therapist died. So now we got the mask for five, four, three, and we got one of the killers in part two. And I wasn't a fan of this. I was not a fan of them killing Annika like this soon and like this. I didn't like it because I actually liked the character and I think the actress deserved a little more. But you got to have a high body count. Now the group wants to. Uh, Trace to call to find out where he is. Uh, Ghostface calls Sam and Tara, and this Ghostface is talking like more vicious, more rude, because this one is Quinn, since Quinn is, quote, dead. So she's doing everything from now until the reveal. And Sam and Tara realize that Ghostface is going to go out to Gale. Ghostface kills Gail's new boyfriend. Ghostface actually gets to talk to Gail on the phone and gets to have a 1v1 with Gail. Gail basically almost dies here. We almost lose two legacy characters back to back in two movies. But Sam and Tara save Gail and they make a plan to go to the movie shrine the Ghostface Shrine where uh, Jason and Greg, who owned it, quote, owned it because it was actually owned by Richie Kurtz to lure him in and execute him. From there, we move to the subway scene. Sam, Tara, Danny, and Chad are on one subway. Mindy and Ethan are on another. Basically 10 minutes away from each other and 10 stops. Mindy gets attacked. Look, right before she was supposed to get off, 
by Quinn. She thinks she got her wrong because Ethan's the one that saved her and got her help. And we don't see Ethan again until the big reveal. Uh, Kirby, Sam, Tara, Danny, and Chad all meet up. They go into the Ghost Race Shrine. I didn't talk about that because it's well known that there was a ghost face shine in this movie. Uh, Sam says she doesn't trust him because he's not Woodsboro. And then Danny leaves. We don't see him again until the end. He goes to get re reinforcements. Uh, Detective Bailey said that he contacted the Atlanta field office and... Kirby has been on a downward spiral since the Ghostface attacks last year, and that she's Ghostface, which was a big lie. S Sam got her father's knife and armed herself to fight back, and she went to go look for uh, Tara and Chad. Tara and Chad are having a moment. They finally kiss, and they get attacked. And then we get a chase scene from Ghostface chasing Tara Chad and Sam around the shrine then as they are fighting back uh, another Ghostface pops up stabs Chad in the ribs upper chest he gets stabbed I want to say 10 times a piece from the two Ghostfaces and then the Ghostfaces chase the Carpenter sisters out Kirby comes out, starts shooting. Ghost races disperse. Detective Bailey comes in, shoots her, and uh, says that Kirby's ghost face, you killed my daughter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, ghost race comes behind him, he shoots uh, Kirby, revealing that he is another ghost face. And we have three ghost faces in this movie, and it is Quinn, Ethan, and Detective Bailey. And they are Richie's family, and they want to do this for revenge. And there apparently was a deleted scene where they kill their mother, because their mother doesn't want to get revenge. So, some chases happen. Uh, Sam stabs Ethan about ten times. They climb to the uh, rafters of the uh, shrine, and Tara slips. Saying, you gotta let me go. Tara gets uh, the Billy Loomis knife, stabs Ethan Landry in the mouth, killing him. And shoots Quinn in the head after saying, we're down another brother. She tackles Detective Bailey off the uh, scaffolding to the floor. Uh, when he wakes up, she's gone. She puts on her father's costume, the original Ghostface costume. And she stabs him, I want to say, 20 times. And saying... I'm not my father, I never will be, And but you did mess with our family, and stabs him in the face, in the eyes area, killing him, Ethan uh, comes back for that last ghost race jump scare, and Kirby throws a stew mock or TV on him, because the ghost race shrine had all evidence, everything from the past four movies, and... That is it. Uh, Kirby's alive, gets put in the ambulance. They think Chad is dead, but like I said, he's the new Dewey. He survived because he's a part of the core four. Mindy comes saying that it's uh, Detective Bailey and Ethan, so she got a ride, but she missed the monologue. Sam leaves the last ghost face mask behind as they walk off into the sunset. And uh, Quinn had Stu Mockers, and Ethan had Mrs. Loomis, and Bailey had Billy Loomis's uh, Ghostface mask. And then we get a uh, Ghostface uh, title sequence screen again of uh, him loading, uh, cranking up a shotgun, and a post credit scene saying, "Not every movie needs a post credit scene," and that is the last scene of the movie. Now, all in all, Scream Six. Fun ride. I enjoyed it. I saw it three times opening opening weekend. Devin uh, Nagoda, who played Annika, 
She was one of my favorite parts of this movie. I wish she would have got more time. Jenna Ortega did a fantastic job as always. And Melissa Barrera, the Sam character, I didn't mind her in Scream 5, but she was much more likable and tamed in this movie. That the turnaround from the hate on her is a beautiful thing to see. Scream 6 and Scream 1, I can flip-flop. But Scream 6, I think since it's like so new, and I've seen it like, I want to say, 8 times now... I'm loving it more and more and more, cause I love I love seeing Jenna Ortega, I love seeing Melissa Barrera and that character grow. Gail Weathers and Kirby had decent screen time, and Annika was my new favorite character. And the Meeks twins, they did fantastic too. Chad did a complete 180 as a character, but ne- and. I don't see that many flaws in this movie. If any flaws. Now that's going to be it for the ranking. I would like to thank you guys for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe. Tap the little bell on that YouTube app so you guys never miss an upload. And if Scream 7 does get announced after I make this and it comes out, I will do another re-ranking of it down the line. But until then... I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.